Welcome to the forge, my wanton wildlings. I'm your creepsmith, and I hope you like my work. Welcome back, wildlings. You may have noticed, forests are somehow just naturally scary. Forests where people disappear? They're scarier. But what happens in tonight's story is a whole different kind of chilling. What story is that? The Trees Are Full of Meat by Paper Cut Sunset from Reddit No Sleep. There's something wrong with the trees near my house. I first noticed it about two weeks ago when the wind changed. It does that every year. The wind that comes in from the west usually reeks of sea spray, hot garbage, and wildfire smoke. Usually I don't question it. Recently though, it has smelled more and more like warm meat, and I'm only just realizing that it always has. I know what hot meat smells like. I worked at a subway back in college, and I work at a deli now. I own a panini press. At the request of my son, I have put salami on my eyes like cucumbers at a spa. I knew what this smell was. This was meat. This was blood, fat, and muscle tissue. I got acclimated to it quickly, like the scent of sulfurous sprinkler water. It was more of an inconvenience than anything, really. It was just another nasty smell that I had to deal with on my day-to-day -day journey. I wasn't sure where it was coming from, but a point came where I didn't mind all that much. But then, I decided to go camping in a local park with my son. And I think I found the source. I've always been pretty good at camping. I was an Eagle Scout. I spent a month living off the land after I graduated from high school. I was settled down with college and my scouting days far behind me. A girlfriend who gave birth and abandoned the kids and I. And a wonderful son that I would do anything for. So. During all of that, I hadn't really had the chance to go camping much. My son was three now, and he had been begging to go since he saw a tent on television, so I promised that we would. I figured that we'd go to the park, set up camp, roast some marshmallows and hot dogs over the park's grill, or some sort of fire pit take a nap, and then go back home before I had to leave for work the next morning. But, well, Michael made it clear that he wanted to actually sleep in the tent. I figured a long walk would tucker him out, so after we set up our campsite with a small assortment of toys inside the tent, we went on a walk around the ark down by the river. There's something they don't ever tell you about having a three-year-old. They're so frail, but so goddamn versatile. He brought a Barbie doll and a toy car with him. It was little Hot Wheels that he kept scraping across the bark of trees just off the trail. By the time we got to the water, he was tired but determined to keep going. We spent a few minutes splashing around in the water, but that didn't last long. Knowing better than to let my little guy completely exhaust himself, I'd seen him get terrible when he was tired, I decided to pick him up and carry him back. When he fell asleep, my son pressed his toy car into my neck so that it fell down into my shirt. The Barbie was in my back pocket. I fished the car out with my free hand and absent-mindedly started doing what my son had been doing with it. The clicking of plastic wheels on aspen bark was a welcome break from the frogs and cicadas and cars polluting the night air with noise. And that was when it happened. The wheel or front grill, maybe, of the little metal and plastic mystery machine caught on the bark and tore some of it free. Now I expected aspen with which I was familiar. I expected splintering. What I got was salami. There's no other way to put it. The meat of the tree was just that, meat. It was a dull, 
pinkish color like the kind of salami you find in the back of your fridge, uh, the kind you forget about until it goes bad. Little cells of herbs and fat populated it, dotting it like, well, salami. That's the only way I can put it. I wanted to stop and investigate, but truth be told, I wasn't in the mood. I had a limp three-year-old on my hip and shoulder and a campsite waiting for me. Uh, I wanted to know more, but I was going to have to wait. I returned to camp, put my son in his sleeping bag, and dreamed of lunch meat. The next morning, I decided to be methodical in my exploration. Morbid curiosity spurred me on. It was like an itch that I just had to scratch. What I'd seen under that tree bark the night before, it, wow. It was Sunday, so my son was going to church with my mother. That was our agreement. She would watch him while I worked in exchange for being allowed to take him to church on Sundays. She wasn't part of a doomsday cult or anything, so I didn't mind. I brought a hatchet, a notepad and pen, and a flashlight. I didn't think that I would need a light, but I figured that it would at least help me determine what I was looking at if I found anything at all. See, I know my meat. Everyone in this town does. It's just a side effect of living here. We have a massive butcher's shop. Not massive in terms of size, but of popularity. We have so much of it in town that they sell it for cheap. It's cheaper than water here. It's more plentiful than bread. Our town has traditions like senior high schoolers sharing prosciutto on the 50-yard line until their lips meet, welcoming home college kids and missionaries with plates of brownies and cold cuts, coronaries and cardiovascular disease by age 35. Guaranteed. I know my meat. I can tell different varieties just at a glance. What I found was that at the edge of the woods, the trees were normal. They were aspens, birch, spruce. They were the kind of trees that you might expect to see in a normal forest. My incisions with the edge of the hatchet showed just that. Then there was a second layer. It was as far as I had walked with my son the night before. Salami, pepperoni, pork, thick gray slabs of unsliced roast beef. This was what populated the second layer. It was odd, and I took pictures and made notes of every variety that I found. Different sausages, even lardo. It was all meat. The river intersected the path there, cutting the section in two. On one side was the second layer, and on the other side was the third. And the third layer was even weirder. Wind bit my skin and howled through the branches as my hatchet hit once more, and I realized that inside of this tree, just on the other side of the river, was raw. Most of this third layer seemed to be different types of red meat. It was a uh, cut, ground, whole, all uncooked. Blood oozed out of the wedge-shaped incisions, and it smelled like a butcher's shop in here. Which, I suppose, it was. One thing that I noticed between all the walking, hacking, and note-taking were the bones. They grew more and more frequent as I walked further in. Periosteum and Matrix cracked under my shitty off-brand boat shoes. I hadn't prepared for this kind of journey. I wanted to turn back, but something compelled me forward. It was drawing me in. I couldn't keep myself from heeding the siren song of what was at the center of the forest. Now the fourth layer, the fourth layer had more gristle, more bone, and more weeping. What looked like a dog was growing out of one tree, a, a rabbit was trapped in another. Maybe they weren't trying to get out, I realized, as I shivered and walked past. Maybe... Uh, maybe something was pulling them in. But I wasn't sure. I didn't make meat. I wasn't a butcher. I just prepared it. I just sold it. As I took step after step toward what I knew was the center, 
The scent of blood and decay got stronger to the point where it was overwhelming. The air was pregnant with malice. The branches overhead were thicker, blotting out more of the noonday sun. I would have brought my shirt up over my nose if I thought that it would help, but I knew that it wouldn't. The stench was godlike. It was all-powerful, omnipresent, overwhelming. Along the same vein, my flashlight didn't do much help. It illuminated about a foot in front of me. The darkness was dense. It couldn't quite cut through it. I was able to see enough, though, and I pressed on, determined to get to the middle of the forest just down the block from my house. Keep in mind, I wasn't far from home. This was technically a part of the public park that my son and I had camped in the night before. I'd spent time in this stretch of trees my entire life, and I didn't know why I was seeing it differently now. I still don't. The thing in the middle wasn't even pretending to be a tree. It was in the shape of one, sure, but it hadn't grown bark. It was a large, fleshy mass of hundreds of human bodies that were writhing and fused together. Flesh of all colors and kinds, smooth, waxy, packed, was wrapped around a trunk made of bones, organs, and other viscera. There were three giant holes in it that oozed blood and mucus that stared out at me like eyes. The true horror of all the writhing, all the rotting human meat was only revealed when the beam of my flashlight panned up, held in one unsteady hand. Then I could see the holes that it had for eyes weren't empty, but that the irises of two nauseatingly wet balls of bloodshot sclero were projecting the promise of an endless void of thick vitreous humor within. The eyes blinked and black tears thickened like gravy with grime and mucus and all manner of terrible things like the excrement of a thousand dirty sebaceous glands rolled down the fleshy trunk in a putrid waterfall that made me want to toss my cookies. The mouth opened and I realized that the heavy, labored breathing that I'd been hearing was not my own. It was this thing in front of me, this human tree bringing all sorts of air into a thousand heaving lungs, all interconnected by fibrous tubes, I could see bulging against the exterior of this thing, this human tree, into sacks and through all the mucus. I stepped back, wanting to get away, but morbidly enthralled. A twig crunched under my foot, or was it a bone? I couldn't tell. My hands shook, and the notebook and hatchet fell. Everything I was holding fell from my hands. I was left in almost complete darkness when the plastic cap of the flashlight popped off and the beam stopped shining. Only the light of the moon, filtering in through finger-bone branches, lit the area. The tree opened its horrible mouth, revealing far too many teeth, an unfathomable number of them, and spoke with a voice that was as strangled as the dogs I'd seen on the way in here. Liquid gurgled somewhere in its many throats, and it licked its lips with a tongue covered in twigs and black hair, wet with dripping yellow snot. It wheezed. I didn't stick around to hear the end of that weird-ass monologue. I'd seen enough. I had heard and smelled enough. I took off running, tearing through the branches that clawed at my skin, that latched onto me and tried to pull me into their trunks. I didn't stop. The only thing on my mind was getting out of there. The only thing on my mind was survival and escaping the trees at the center of that forest. Uh-huh. I'm thinking I'm going to take up vegetarianism. Not because meat's 
grossing me out or anything, but because if plants are going to do this to people, we all need to defend ourselves. Oh, and I'm going to need to learn to make wood grain alcohol. Yeah. So, stay scary, my wildlings. Never trust a tree. And make the most of your nights.